we can still speak while people register, of course. Ça va, Elodie? Oui, très bien. Tu peux y être. How are you? <laughs> By the time we're done this, you'll have seen almost everything. Hello. Good. How are you? Um, Jen. Yes. When, when I do the presentation, I'll, I'll probably um, minimize the the pictures on the screen um, like this, um, just so that it's not taking up the the screen here. Um, so if you have anything that you need to interrupt me for, just just interrupt me. Um, if there's something that you need to let me know, sure. if something stops working. Okay. Okay. Sure, but normally it will go smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> but I I will if I need. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think that now we can uh, uh, we can start. Um, so welcome everyone to uh, this week uh, seminar. Uh, so um, quite unusually, it's now today only online just because uh, uh, Patrick is in Perpignan and it was complicated uh, uh, to come to Montpellier uh, given that the uh, invited uh, researcher um, who's hosting Patrick in uh, Perpignan is um, today very busy. Um, so um, as usual, uh, people who attend online, you can ask your question in the Q&A tab. And at the end of the webinar, we will allow you to uh, speak and interact di directly with uh, Patrick. And with that, Patrick, um, so as Pan, I leave it up to you to say a few words about your background and um, we're looking forward to your seminar. Great, okay, thank you, Jen. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming. I'll say hi um, to everyone who's here in person in Perpignan and I apologize to everyone in Montpellier that I'm not there in person. It would be, somebody would have to be online, I guess. Um, so <laughs> it, it just happened to be this way. Um, so, um, as uh, Gian mentioned, uh, Benjamin sends his apologies. Um, he's doing an important PhD thing, um, concours, I think it's called. <laughs> and so um, he's not able to be here um, to do the introduction. So I'll introduce myself, but I'll just start by saying that today I'm going to talk to you about some of the research that I've done over the past, I guess, almost eight years on trying to understand. Um, how the disease schistosomiasis progresses from the perspective of a snail. So um, to introduce you to me, um, I am from Canada. And so I apologize, my, my French is not good enough to be able to give this seminar in French. <laughs> um, I'm from Western Canada, where we learn a lot about conjugating verbs and writing French, but we don't ever speak French. So um, I'm slowly getting better. 
but I've, uh, I've listed here on this map where I currently am located in Edmonton, Alberta. And um, I did my undergraduate degree. I grew up in Edmonton. I did my undergraduate degree in Edmonton at the University of Alberta, and I did my PhD there. And then I went to do a postdoctoral position at the University of New Mexico um, in the Southern United States with um, Dr. Sam Loker. And that's where I started working on the immunology of snails and schistosomes. During my PhD, I actually worked on the immunology of goldfish. Um, and um, there's what I'm going to talk to you about today actually is sort of a long thread of my research career that started when I worked on goldfish and how has transitioned to when I work on snails. Um, after spending about three years in New Mexico, I was applying for faculty positions back in Canada, and I applied for eight positions. And the only one that I even interviewed at was back in Edmonton. So um, by no control of my own, I ended up back where I started. And so now I am back in Edmonton. It's a nice city. I'll show you a picture in a minute. But um, so uh, I'm just in a different faculty. So I'm in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta, and I've been there since 2011 um, at this position. So this is uh, what Edmonton looks like. Um, for those of you here in Perfect Non, I've shown you this already. Um, it's a city of about 1 million people, and the University of Alberta, um, shown here on the left, is a university that is home to about 40,000 undergraduate students um, and 18 different academic faculties. It's the largest university in Alberta, um, and it has a, a, a real focus on life sciences, um, health research, and engineering. This um, is what I show you Edmonton looks like normally. It, it looks like this because we're quite far north and we spend a lot of our time under snow in the winter. Um, so uh, a lot of my research is done in the laboratory, although I do some research in the field uh, when it looks like this outside. And uh, you have to become very accustomed to skiing and skating and other winter activities because a lot of the time of the year, it looks like this and is very cold. Uh, uh, to give some context, it's as cold or colder as it is in your freezer in your lab um, most of the time. So um, it's chilly enough that you don't want to be outside for too long. And um, so this is where I do uh, all of my research. I um, run my own research laboratory where I um, have masters and PhD students and postdoctoral fellows that work on a number of different areas related to snails and parasitic flatworms or digenian trematodes. And before I start talking about that, I really want to thank um, the CMAB LabX program and the University uh, of Perpignan for hosting me here during my visit, especially um, Benjamin, Christoph, David, and Richard, um, who have been very gracious with their time, um, showing me around, giving me some pointers, and um, lots of great scientific discussions that I think will lead to um, some really exciting collaborations in the future. So um, I wouldn't be here without them and the support from these programs. So um, I wanted to give my acknowledgments to that um, right away. So like I said, uh, digenian trematodes are what um, really fascinate me. And um, on the screen here, you can see um, these are parasitic flatworms that have a huge diversity of morphological uh, presentations at their larval stage, the circarial stage shown up here at the top. They are typically um, very frequently associated with either medically or veterinarily important parasitic diseases of humans and animals, some of these adult worms shown here, that parasitize different organs and tissues within the vertebrate host, um, causing disease uh, of various severities. They also are known to be manipulators of their hosts. And so there's some very exciting research on how digenian trematodes manipulate the behavior of hosts to facilitate transmission into um, the next host. Um, these are great examples, leucochloridium or dicrocelium dendriticum, um, which are both really well-known host manipulators. What I find most fascinating about these parasites is that they all, most all, use snails for their larval development. Um, there are some exceptions to that rule, but uh, the vast majority rely on snails to complete their asexual reproduction and produce circaria that then go on to either infect the um, 
the first intermediate host or uh, the definitive host. This allows for some very exciting research to be undertaken um, related to the long-term um, co-evolution that has occurred between snails and digenetic trematodes. Um, for hundreds of millions of years, these um, two different groups of organisms, one a host, one a, a pathogen, um, have interacted. And it has created a situation where snails have evolved a number of very exciting and unique immunological processes to combat the um, unique immunological things that parasites are doing to try to overcome their defenses. Out of all these parasites, though, the one that I would like to talk about today is this one. Um, this is Schistosoma mansoni, and it's a very important um, digenetic trematode that um, resides within the blood vessels of the human host. There are three primary species, and if we don't count hybrids, which complicate matters, um, that infect humans. This is Schistosoma mansoni, but there are Schistosoma hematobium and Schistosoma japonicum, which are also important human disease-causing agents that infect over 200 million people worldwide. This parasite requires a specific snail host in order to complete its life cycle. The um, Schistosoma mansoni in particular requires snails of the genus Biomphalaria, which are um, sort of drawn here. Um, and so Biomphalaria glabrata, which is a, um, a South American species of Biomphalaria, um, is the intermediate host for Schistosoma mansoni. And within that snail, the parasite will develop. And when it develops, it will then go on to produce cercariae, which are the form that are able to penetrate the skin of the human definitive host causing disease. The parasite will mature within the human host. The adult worms will pair up and eventually start producing eggs, which are then released into the excreta, uh, or into the environment through the excreta. The eggs will hatch and produce another free living stage called Amyracidia, which is the stage that is seeking out and will penetrate the tegument of the intermediate host, the snail, uh, and then complete the life cycle of the parasite. Um, I'll take a quick aside here and just acknowledge um, a very artistically talented graduate student in my lab, Christina Bohe, um, who um, artistically has sort of diagrammed this life cycle. There will be a few other slides that have this sort of blue background, which Christina also drew. Um, and so I shouldn't take credit for these artistic skills because my life cycle is from the CDC and that's all I can do. And so um, Christina has taken a lot of effort to make these look a lot nicer. So um, give props to Christina for the life cycle. So um, there's a number of reasons why studying these uh, snail schistosome interfaces are really interesting and important. One is that uh, schistosomiasis as a disease is largely um, combated by mass drug administration using pretty much a single available drug, which is called proziquantel. And in 2012, I want to say, um, the company that makes proziquantel, Merck, um, agreed to help distribute 10 times more proziquantel um, in endemic countries than had been previously administered with the goal uh, in partnership with the WHO of eliminating schistosomiasis by 2025. We're nearly there and we're not gonna reach that accomplishment. Um, but one of the drawbacks of um, adding 10 times more proziquantel into a control program is that there's a lot more concern now for the development of drug resistance to proziquantel which is the focus of a lot of other people's research now within this space. Experimentally, um, I can show you here just in a few examples, um, we can induce drug resistance to proziquantel in schistosomes. Um, however, in a natural setting, there are um, some questions about whether or not drug resistance has started to emerge or not. And so this may be um, a red herring that isn't really going to end up being a problem for schistosome control efforts, but it is something we have to be conscious of as we now have to realize that proziquantel administration will not lead to elimination of schistosomiasis by 2025. This is also um, complemented by the fact that in a meta-analysis that was published by Suzanne Sokolow in 2016 um, of control programs that have registered 
um, a reduction in the prevalence of schistosomiasis within communities in endemic countries, it's very clear that not including snail control efforts into control programs will not lead to sustained or even potentially effective control of schistosomiasis. This figure from uh, Suzanne's paper shows you a comparison of these different studies that are binned based on whether or not there is little to no snail control, intermediate snail control, or complete snail control. And you can see here then uh, at the, on the x-axis, there's each of these three main groups are then subdivided into whether or not there was mass drug administration or, uh, or extensive mass drug administration. So no mass drug administration or extensive. Um, what I really wanna draw your attention to is the comparison between um, a control, these 13 control programs that had no snail control, but had intermediate or extensive mass drug administration compared to control programs that had complete snail control, <clears throat> but had little to no mass drug administration. When we look at what this y-axis is showing, which is a reduction in the prevalence of schistosomiasis within a community, we can see very clearly that <clears throat> even if you have no prosequantal administration in, an, in, in a community, you'll achieve higher and nearly 100% prevalence reduction if you use only snail control, whereas at best you'll receive around 50 to 60% reduction in prevalence using mass drug administration alone without snail control. This really highlights, I think, the importance of the snail stage of this infection. And I think it really emphasizes the importance of trying to understand more about the snail stage of the infection because these snail control efforts are largely administered through um, environmental application of chemicals that are known molluscicides, um, niclosamine or copper sulfate, both of which have many off-target effects that have ecosystem-wide consequences. Um, and we need to design and be able to utilize more effective snail-specific control program efforts in the future so that we don't have these significant off-target effects when we apply snail control programs as part of our um, control programs for schistosomiasis. So that leads me to, um, to my model system I'd like to talk to you about today. These are two different strains of biomphalaria glabrata. And so much like um, we hear about in the mouse research world where we have different mice strains, the same is true for biomphalaria glabrata. And on, um, on one side here, sorry, this left side, we have um, what we call the M-line strain, which is susceptible to schistosoma mansoni. And on the right-hand side, we have this BS90 strain, which is immunologically resistant to most strains of S. mansoni. So these two different strains of biomphalaria exhibit compatibility polymorphism with respect to their ability to uh, immunologically defend themselves against challenge with S. mansoni. And we leverage these two strains to try to understand what an immunologically resistant strain is doing different than a strain that is compatible. Now, to quickly introduce you to what we know currently about a snail immune response, um, we know that the snail, like any animal with an immune response, with the exception of maybe nematodes, has both a cellular and a humoral branch to their immune response. The cellular response um, is comprised of three sort of loosely defined morphological types of immune cell. The granulocyte, which is granular in nature and very phagocytic. The hyalinocyte, um, which can be adherent but lacks granules or significant granules. And the blast cell, which um, I think the people here in Perpignan are doing um, a lot of work to try to figure out more about. So um, I won't tell you much about what that cell is doing. Um, but at the end, I have some insights into what might be happening with some of the blast and hyalinocytes um, that I'll, I'll introduce you to. In addition to the cellular component, we have this humoral component, which um, again, the team here at Perpignan has done a lot of work to try to help characterize. Um, we have uh, lytic factors, um, pore forming toxins like biomphalicin. We have the thioester uh, proteins, which are very much akin to the complement system of other uh, organisms. We have fibrinogen-related proteins, which serve as a recognition uh, 
um, factor for targets on the surface of these parasitic um, larval parasites. We have factors like BG-MIF, which um, has been shown to be uh, an attractor of hemocytes. And then we have the um, focus of what I'd like to talk about today, which is um, this bimfilaria granulin. This is a, a growth factor and immunostimulatory factor that I would like to show you some evidence to, show, to support this idea that it's important for um, the proliferation and differentiation of hemocyte populations within the snail, particularly this specific subset of hemocytes that are positive for a toll-like receptor on their surface. So this will be the focus of what I'd like to talk about today. Um, and um, not to sort of leave these out because they're also very, very important, um, but you might have actually heard about some of these things in past seminars from the team from Perpignan before. You probably haven't heard about these yet. So try to talk about something new. So um, what I'd like to start with here from a, a model perspective is um, a biomphilaria snail that has been parasitized by Schistosoma mansoni. There is a sporocyst within the snail. And if that snail is going to defend itself successfully, we know that the humoral factors that I just introduced you to um, are important for recognizing, damaging, and recruiting granulocytic immune cells to the surface of the parasite to allow that sporocyst to be encapsulated by hemocytes, which eventually and very often leads to the death of the parasite. Um, so this process over here is something I'm not going to focus on today, but what I do want to focus on is how we get these granulocytes to be generated and whether or not all granulocytes are functionally similar or if there are functionally distinct groups that we can characterize. So before we started this project, we um, knew a little bit about hemocyte biology. Um, a lot of hemocytes in the snails that we work on look like this under a microscope. They're usually very adherent, um, and uh, they have this sort of spread out, almost fibroblast-like appearance um, under a microscope. If you look at some of the studies that have been published looking at the interface between sporocysts, which are these um, structures that are darker gray labeled with S, um, and the interface between the hemocytes, which are these cells labeled with H, um, there's usually a very tight association um, at that encapsulated uh, parasite interface where the hemocytes are in direct contact with the tegument of the sporocyst. And in vitro, if you take hemocytes from a susceptible snail and incubate them with the sporocysts of a parasite, um, susceptible snail hemocytes are very bad at encapsulating the sporocyst. Whereas if you take hemocytes from a snail that's resistant to that parasite, they'll very quickly encapsulate it um, and be attracted to it um, um, in a way that you would expect snails or hemocytes from a resistant snail to behave. Now, in 2015, um, the lab of Chris Bain tried to understand a little bit more about why some snails are resistant and some are susceptible to S. mansoni. And they published a paper that suggested that the number of hemocytes that um, they measured by the spread hemocyte number, so they're looking at hemocytes that adhere to a glass slide, the spread hemocyte number loosely correlated with the resistance phenotype. So on the x-axis here, we have the percentage of the snails that are susceptible to challenge. And on the y-axis, we have the number of spread hemocytes per volume of hemolymph. And what they're showing you here is that if you have a lot of spread hemocytes, you tend to have a zero susceptibility phenotype, which could be also reported as a 100% resistant phenotype. Now, um, when we look at our BS90 and M-line snails, we do find that our BS90 snails tend to have about double the number of spread hemocytes per microliter of hemolymph than do the M-line snails. But an important observation of the Bain group paper is that there are also snails that fall into this category that have very few spread hemocytes um, comparable to snails that are very susceptible, but are also resistant to infection. So the relationship between just the number of hemocytes and the compatibility phenotype is not a very clear one based on this publication. So we wanted to try to understand if we could 
further characterize what was going on with hemocytes in a resistant snail phenotype. The first part of this investigation led us to try to understand more about where hemocytes come from in the first place. Um, John Sullivan um, in the United States has done a lot of work to characterize an organ which is right up next to the heart in, uh, in biomfilaria snails called the amoebocyte producing organ, um, which is often abbreviated as the APO. Um, when you challenge a snail with a schistosome or another digenian trematode, the APO um, is known to have a number of mitotic acti uh, activities going on within it. And so in this um, image, which correlates to this paper that John published, you can see if you expose a snail um, to uh, Myricidia freeze-thaw extracts, that's what this MFTE stands for, compared to controls, the number of mitotic events in the APO is significantly higher. Um, we can show that using a label called EDU, which incorporates into newly synthesized DNA. And we can see the APO um, is very mitotically active, even just under normal circumstances where we haven't injected the snail with anything. Now that led us to try to understand more about, well, what are endogenous growth factors that are driving hematopoiesis in the snail? And are those important for um, generating and maintaining a functionally relevant population of hemocytes within the snail? And are those populations different between a susceptible snail and a resistant snail? A lot of work went into looking at that, um, but this growth factor that I've shown you here, which is a, called a granulin, is one growth factor that emerged as being very highly expressed um, compared uh, in a resistant snail phenotype compared to a susceptible one. It also emerged as being very, um, very responsive to um, increasing in expression after we challenge a snail. So um, granulins are a really interesting group of growth factors that are very conserved throughout metazoans. They have a very um, identifiable um, structure and amino acid sequence that is comprised of this 12 cysteine repeat motif that is repeated a number of times within uh, an organism. The number of times that these repeats are observed um, is really just dependent on the organism. So in humans, we have seven and a half um, granulin motif repeats in our granulin. Fish have two different granulins, one that has 11 repeats and one that has one and a half. And biomfilaria has four repeats in its um, granulin. That um, repeat structure gives granulins a very, um, a very consistent three-dimensional structure that allows us to sort of show that if we overlay um, a human granulin with a snail granulin, they tend to match fairly um, significantly. And what's exciting about granulins is that they can be produced as both a propeptide that includes all of the domains, the granulin domains, and then neutrophil elastases can come in and cleave at these red positions to create different versions of granulin that can be functionally distinct from the propeptide. So we went about um, generating a bunch of resources to help us characterize granulin. We made a recombinant granulin and a polyclonal antibody to um, the recombinant pro-granulin. We did a comprehensive um, RNA and protein assessment of uh, granulin expression following challenge with S. mansoni. So you can see that within the first 24 hours, we see a significant increase in the uh, sort of transcript abundance of granulin, both in the BS90 snails shown in blue and in the M-line snails shown in red, but these are not um, on the same scale. So you'll notice that in the BS90 snails, we have almost a 40-fold increase in expression, whereas in the M-lines, it's a 15-fold uh, increase. Really interestingly as well, we see earlier protein level changes um, in the BS90s. So after one day, we see um, the emergence of a very prominent uh, protein band when we probe plasma with our antibody. However, in M lines, it takes a little bit longer for that to happen, which we think may be one of the kinetic issues that M line snails are dealing with, that BS90s are quicker to generate this particular group of hemocytes that I'm going to show you that M lines are not able to make in time. Um, before the parasite has established. We also developed um, uh, SI RNA based 
RNA interference um, tool for granulin that allowed us to knock down granulin expression at around four days uh, post-injection in bimfilaria snails. And when we took those day, four-day uh, siRNA in, uh, injected snails and we challenged them with s mansoni, what we find is that granulin expression is completely abrogated. So we can prevent that increase in expression um, from happening if we um, inject the snails with this siRNA in advance uh, of them being challenged. So that let us try to functionally characterize granulins um, in the snail system. And so I'm going to walk you through a few um, relatively complex experiments that we did that I'm trying to simplify um, by breaking these down a little bit. Um, so really um, importantly, we um, had designed um, a, a flow cytometric assay that allowed us to measure the number of cells that we would bleed from a biomphalaria snail that were prolifer proliferative. And so we did that using either BRDU or EDU as a dye that intercalates with newly synthesized DNA and allows us to measure cells that have proliferated between the time that we injected them with the BRDU or the EDU and the time that we harvested the cells. So this is an example of what that experiment looks like where BRDU positivity is shown on the Y axis. And so BRDU positive cells are shown in this upper left quadrant. Um, the BRDU negative cells are shown in the bottom left quadrant. So any cell that has proliferated between the time that we injected the BRDU into the snail and the time that we looked at the cells under the microscope or in the flow cytometer is up in this left corner, upper left corner. If we look at these cells under a microscope um, and we counterstain with DAPI, you can see the DAPI stained nuclei are shown in blue and any cells that are co-labeled with BRDU or EDU are labeled kind of in this pink, um, which is the sort of co-labeling that'll happen. So even in a snail that is just at a homeostatic level doing its normal thing, um, we see around between 15 and 20 something percent of the cells over um, a two day period of time will be uh, incorporating BRDU. Um, and so we have this sort of basal level of cellular turnover that is producing um, our circulating hemocytes. And then we can use um, the sort of very canonical mitogenic agent, um, four-ball myricetyl acetate, PMA, I'm going to call it PMA. Um, and we can use that to induce um, an increase in proliferation in biomphalaria snails by injecting it into, into the snail. Um, and that induction of proliferation is abrogated by the inclusion of this UO126 agent, which prevents um, the MAP kinase pathway from proceeding, which is how PMA is inducing proliferation. And then if we take our recombinant granulin, you can see that in a dose-dependent manner, we can induce proliferation using granulin as well in um, circulating hemocytes. And we also can see that that induction of proliferation is also dependent on activation of the MAP kinase pathway. We can um, use UO126 in combination with granulin to abrogate the proliferative effects. And we can also use a phospho PERK antibody to show that when granulin stimulation is occurring, the ERK pathway is, is being phosphorylated, which is part of that MAP kinase pathway. Um, that is probably how granulin is having its effect. And that is how granulins and mammals and fish also have their effect, which is why we even chose to include this experiment in the first place. You can see that under the microscope, we also see an increase in the proportion of cells that are co-labeled with BRDU and DAPI. So this um, confirms the flow cytometric data that we were seeing that there's more cells that are BRDU positive when we inject granulin into a snail and then harvest the cells later. So this led us to um, do a number of other experiments that I'm just gonna quickly sort of summarize here in text. So we, um, we show that um, this recombinant granulin is able to um, produce uh, an increase in the number of adherent or granulocytic hemocytes, both in the M-line and the BS90 strains of biomphalaria glabrata. If we knocked down granulin, um, that would lead to a marginal but not significant reduction in the number of circulating adherent hemocytes in the BS90 snails. 
Um, if we pre-incubated the recombinant granulin with our polyclonal antibody, we would also be able to abrogate that proliferative effect that would happen if we injected that, that um, blocked recombinant granulin into a snail. But what was really exciting for us and what led us to the next stage of these experiments was that if we injected an M-line snail with granulin, we could get the number of circulating hemocytes to reach nearly BS90 levels um, by doing that injection. So this allowed us to then ask questions about whether if we took a snail that had a low number of circulating hemocytes and increased the number of circulating hemocytes in that snail, did that make it resistant to S. mansoni infection? So that was our question. If we took these snails that we've induced to have a higher circulating number of adherent hemocytes, do they now become resistant to S. mansoni? The answer to that question is yes, they do become resistant. So I'll draw your attention first to the M-line recombinant protein control. So this is our control group of snails that show um, a number of snails that are shedding circariae. So we usually reach around 80% of our M-line snails releasing circariae by around seven weeks post-challenge. If those snails had been injected with granulin in advance, this is an N of 100 snails that we injected with granulin. We see um, a significant reduction in the number of snails that are shedding circaria at the same time. Now, those snails are not completely resistant, which is what we see with the BS90 snails. The, the triangle control down at the bottom, our BS90s, none of them shed circaria. But if we knock down granulin in the BS90s, we do see a few of them lead to shedding circaria. So this led us to um, some exciting sort of next steps. First, um, this was the first example of a gain of resistance in um, a susceptible biomfilaria snail using a specific individual factor. So that was very exciting for us. Um, it also showed us that there were endogenous factors produced by biomfilaria that controlled hemocyte development and proliferation. But it still didn't answer the question I introduced you to at the very beginning. Our M-line snails that were inducing to become refractory to infection is that just because they have more hemocytes there or is granulin creating a, new, a different hemocyte profile? And it's those hemocytes that are different that are causing them to be resistant. So we're looking now to see whether or not we could characterize a functionally distinct group of hemocytes within that group that we've induced to proliferate. So that required us to investigate markers of hemocytes. And this is not easy. Um, as I think people here in Perpignan uh, can attest to, finding a marker of a different group of hemocytes is not an easy task to do. And I think that there's a lot of progress that's been made here towards helping generate um, some uh, really exciting ideas for potential markers. We um, had been working on the cell side of things and had been trying to characterize toll-like receptors in hemocytes. And uh, this was all happening at the same time that the Biomfilaria glabrata genome project was being done. And that genome project um, had some TLR experts as part of it, um, Kate Buckley and Jonathan Rast, who are part of the, they were the ones who characterized the purple sea urchin that has the 222 toll receptors and the 1000 nod-like receptors. So they're very good at finding TLRs. They um, identified uh, at least 27 TLRs within the Biomfilaria glabrata genome. And the ones that we had been working on to functionally characterize fell within these uh, group right here, this group right here, the BGTLR13 and BGTLR10. <clears throat> we knew from a lot of work that we had done to try to characterize these TLRs that was happening before the genome project that um, these were traditional TLRs. They were transmembrane domain containing TLRs with a tier domain in the intracellular region. And they were what we call single cysteine cluster TLRs. These are contrasted by multiple cysteine cluster TLRs. And the general way to distinguish between what these two different TLRs are doing is that these single cysteine cluster TLRs tend to be um, the ones associated with vertebrates. And they are all known to recognize exogenous pathogen associated molecular patterns. The multiple cysteine cluster TLRs often um, are in invertebrates. They are what is reflected by the, 
the first toll in Drosophila, and they often recognize endogenous danger-associated molecular patterns. So our the TLRs that I'm going to talk to you about and the ones that we have been working on, they fall within this single cysteine cluster TLR group. We think that they recognize exogenous PAMPs, and we are pretty sure that they recognize something that's produced by schistosoma mansoni because they're very responsive to schistosoma mansoni, both surface proteins and extracellular uh, excretory secretory products. So I'm not going to walk you through all of the work we did on this TLR, but we made an antibody to it and we did our best to confirm that it was only recognizing the one TLR that we wanted to characterize because there's, like I said, maybe 27. Um, we were pretty sure that our antibody was specific and we were able to show that it recognizes the surface uh, of hemocytes. What was really interesting to us though, was that it does not recognize the surface of all hemocytes. So you can see there are two hemocytes in this image, these two right here, that are not recognized by this TLR antibody. And when we look at it on a, at a flow cytometric level, we find that maybe 20% at most of the hemocytes that we look at have this TLR on their surface. So now what we can do is we can do a flow cytometric assay where we couple the BRDU labeling that I showed you before with a TLR dimension to it as well. So now what I'm showing you are cells that are BRDU positive on the y-axis and TLR positive on the x-axis. And if we inject granulin into snails and then look at the hemocytes four days later, what we find is that there are a, a significant increase in the proportion of cells that are what we would call double positive compared to snails that we inject a, a control uh, protein into. That's highlighted here where about 21% of the circulating hemocytes in this example are BGTLR positive and BG uh, and BRDU positive, whereas in this experiment, um, only about 7% are both double positive are double positive. So what this tells us is that there are, when we inject granulin, the cells that are proliferating are overwhelmingly being moved towards this TLR positive granulocyte phenotype compared to a protein control. So those BRDU positive cells that I was showing you previously are very likely um, uh, also TLR positive, BG TLR positive. So what we did is we decided to set up an experiment where we um, investigated some of the classical features that hemocytes possess to see whether or not these um, the subset of TLR positive hemocytes was um, functionally distinct from TLR negative hemocytes. One of the experiments that we did was to look at reactive oxygen species generation. So um, respiratory burst response has been shown previously to be an important biological function of, grant, of hemocytes um, during that encapsulation and killing response. And so it was a logical thing for us to investigate whether or not um, these BGTLR cells were good at producing ROS. We did that using a flow cytometric assay where we sorted um, cells for either positive or negative negativity for TLR. So these are our TLR negative cells. These are the TLR positive cells. And if we look at whether or not those cells can generate reactive oxygen species using a flow cytometric um, um, respiratory burst assay, we can see that the TLR positive cells are much better at making respiratory burst responses than are the TLR negative cells. So this was exciting to us because it suggested that these TLR positive cells may reflect a functionally distinct category of hemocytes. To further understand this, what we did is we used um, a published um, sporocyst killing assay where we incubate different groups of cells with 10 S. mansoni sporocysts in vitro. And then we look to see how many of those sporocysts are dead after either 24 or 48 hours. So what we did is we, we bled a lot of snails and we sorted cells based on either, either we had an unsorted group, which includes the hyalinocytes, the blast cells, and the granulocytes. We had a group of what we would consider hyalinocytes or blast cells. We had a group that was just all granulocytes based on morphological characterization. And then we sorted cells based on TLR positivity or negativity. 
And what I want to draw your attention to here is first in this upper category here, when we take BS90 hemocytes and we sort them for TLR positivity, you can see that between, uh, let's just focus on the 48 hours maybe, um, nearly all of the sporocysts are dead within that category after 48 hours. Now, the all granulocyte group has nearly the same number there, but those include TLR positive granulocytes. And if we look at the TLR negative granulocytes, we see that they can also kill sporocysts pretty well, but not as good as the TLR positive granulocytes. What's important is we also repeated these experiments using two different inhibitors of respiratory burst response. So if we inhibit the ROS pathway using either NAC or DPI, we nearly completely lose that killing response in vitro of those TLR positive cells. So to us, this really signifies, A, it signifies the importance of respiratory burst response for the killing of the parasite within that, um, that hemocytic capsule. And it also then indicated to us that these TLR positive hemocytes might be very important for um, killing parasites in resistant snail um, situations. So the last thing that I'd like to tell you about is then trying to understand more about how these cells develop within biomphilaria. I showed you this figure where I um, showed you that we see with granulin stimulation an increase in BGTLR positive cells that are also BRDU positive from an in vivo experiment. This is where we inject granulin into a snail, and then later we pull the hemocytes out and look for TLR positive hemocytes that are also BRDU positive. If we replicate that experiment, um, showing it to you here diagrammatically, um, and we, we just show it to you in a different way, um, I want to show you what we see. So here um, we use EDU instead of BRDU, but these EDU positive cells over 72 hours um, continue to increase in, in proportion. And if we take and gate on these EDU positive cells and then look to see how many of them are positive for TLR, we see that at 72 hours post-injection of the snail, um, a substantial number of them are TLR positive. Not all of them. Um, there's quite a few cells here that are not TLR positive, but, a, but there's certainly TLR positive cells there and they increase over time after granulin injection. This in vivo data though is contrasted by what we see in vitro. So if we do a very similar experiment where what we do is we isolate circulating hemocytes out of the snail and we put them through the flow cytometer and sort for this population here in blue, which has low size and low internal complexity compared to these cells in red. This blue group here contains what we consider the hyalinocytes in the blast cells. The red group contains what we consider the granulocytes. So if we sort for hyalinocytes in blast cells um, using a protocol that we developed to keep the cells alive when we do this sorting, and then we take those cells and we stimulate them with recombinant granulin in vitro, this is what we end up finding. So here again, if I, if I look here, I'm going to show you now the proportion of cells that are positive for TLR over 72 hours out of that experiment. You can see that over 72 hours, we see an increase in TLR positivity in vitro, which very much is like what we see in vivo if we inject granulin into a snail. But that's that's contrasted by the fact that we do not see EDU positivity in those same cells. So sorry, my little, this little thing is covering it, but under that, my name is EDU. And this group of highlighted here in yellow, we normally would see EDU positivity here if we were doing an in vivo experiment, but we don't. So this shows us then that um, TLR positive cells can develop but they do not have to be newly proliferated to do so. So that suggests to us that our current working model is that the, either the blast cells or the hyalinocytes, or maybe both of those two cell types, are able to differentiate into granulocytes that are TLR positive. However, they, those cells, once they're in the circulation, do not seem to proliferate. And when we compare that back to what I showed you about the APO, we think that probably what's happening is the proliferation that we see from the granulin injections is due to um, progenitor um, sort of hematopoietic stem cells that are residing within the tissues of the snail 
that are able to proliferate and differentiate into TLR positive granulocytes, but those cells are not present in the circulation of bioinflaria. So our working model, and this is where I'll leave you, um, is that we think that what's happening is that um, we have this encapsulated sporocyst, like I showed you. We have these humoral factors that are important for um, helping target the sporocyst and um, recruiting the cells to the surface. Granulin is also being generated here, and it's having an impact on the APO, which is producing these proliferating new cells that are being released into the circulation within the snail. And granulin is, is having an effect of generating and maybe increasing the proliferation rate of those hematopoietic tissues um, to stimulate the production of new hemocytes. Some of those hemocytes can be TLR positive cells, but what we think is happening is that granulin is more likely having the effect of differentiating existing circulating cells into these TLR positive cells, and that some of those are coming from the APO because of that granulin injection as well. So the other thing that granulin is doing is facilitating the differentiation, we think, of these hyalinocyte blast cells into granulocytes and TLR positive granulocytes. And we think that these TLR positive granulocytes reflect what might be a sort of terminally differentiated hemocyte subset, very much like what we may think is happening with um, a monocyte differentiation into a macrophage in um, a vertebrate immune system, where the cell is entering into a more terminal differentiation state um, because of this stimulation. And then those cells are going on to have the effect of encapsulating the parasite um, and killing through the production of ROS. Um, and we know that these TLR positive cells are very good at that. So we think that they're probably a very critical piece to this killing response in the encapsulation event. And this is where I think there's some really exciting places for us to collaborate here with some of the technologies and methods that have been designed here in Perpignan and the reagents that we designed to help um, characterize these cells uh, in my lab. So with that, I'm, I will stop. Um, there are a lot of people that have helped make all this work. Um, shown here are all the students past and present in my research group. In red are the students that have moved on now and graduated or postdocs, and in green are the ones who still are hanging out. Um, a lot of the work that I showed you today, though, was done by Emmanuel Pila, who was one of my very first graduate students, um, Hong Yu Lee, uh, Jacob Hambrook, and Christina Bohe. And so um, I'll give a special shout out to them because this is a lot of their work. We also um, have a number of funding agencies that have supported us over the years. And so um, obviously, as everyone knows, um, science doesn't happen without the ability to pay for it. So um, I also need to thank them as well. Um, and again, just one last recognition for the CMEB LabX program and the University of Perpignan and everyone here um, who's hosted me because it's been so far, it's been a really great visit and I still have a month to go. So there's still lots of really exciting things I'm sure that we'll talk about. And um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Um, I'll maybe stop sharing the screen for now so I can see everyone. Thanks very much, Patrick, for uh, this very interesting talk. So we can start um, with questions. And we already have one from Anaïs Porté online. So she's saying that she cannot uh, speak directly, but uh, perhaps I can read the question. So apparently, it's a, it's a question from Sylvain from Montpellier. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, is asking uh, with using your flow markers uh, if you've ever tried to transfer uh, sort and reinject hemocytes uh, so the T L R plus minus or G R and plus minus from and into M lines and B S ninety and test the resistance um, uh, and the hemocyte response. Yeah, that's a it's a really great question. Um, so we we have tried to do um, these transfer of resistance experiments, where we aren't as good at labeling the hemocytes as they are here in Perpignan. <laughs> and so I think that what we've often tried to do is is sort the cells, um, and then also try to label them so that we might be able to track whether or not the cells that we've injected into the snail are participating 
in that encapsulation response. That, that has probably been um, maybe an overly complicated way to do that experiment because um, it's, it's diverted our attention more to the labeling of the cells than it has to just understanding if the phenotype changes. Um, so, so I don't have a good answer for you, but I'm very, I'm very encouraged by the fact that um, the people here seem to be very good at labeling the cells. So I think that maybe what we can do is do both. Um, but uh, we do know from experiments that have been done in the past that you can do um, sort of adoptive transfer of resistance by injecting hemocytes into snails. So um, historically, those experiments have been done. Um, what we don't know is what the proportion of cells that were TLR positive or TLR negative or granulocytes or hyalinocytes might, might have been in those transfer experiments. So um, a great question. I don't actually have a good answer for you, but I'm very encouraged by the fact that I think we can get you one and maybe next time I'm in Perpignan next summer when I come back, um, <laughs> um, we'll be able to show you the answer to your question. <laughs> Thanks very much. So is there any question in the room, Patrick? Um, I don't know, any questions here, guys? Yeah. Sure. Ah. Sure. Yeah. So I'll repeat the question for everyone. Yes, thanks. Um, so uh, there's sort of a two part question. So what's the what's the stimulus for going and expression? And then um, sorry, I forget the second part. It relates to the the specificity of the two of the of the protein. So the 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 first the first part of your question, what stimulates it to be expressed um, is a good question. So we know that um, excretory secretory products of parasites will induce granulin expression. Um, we, also, we also know that granulin can induce granulin expression. Um, and so there's a very sort of like auto feedback thing happening. Um, and so we don't know the exact receptor for granulins even in mammals, we know that, that the toll receptor seven in humans, the TNF alpha receptor and, um, and an uh, epidermal growth factor receptor have all been shown experimentally to, um, to bind to granulin and have a biological effect. So um, the current thinking is that there may not be a dedicated granulin receptor um, and the, this leads to this answer to your second part of your question. Granulins, like I mentioned, have this very characteristic three-dimensional structure. And the, the current thinking is that it's actually the, the three-dimensional structure of the granulin that is being recognized, not the specific amino acid sequence. The evidence to support that is many-fold, but maybe the most exciting experiment is, uh, has been done by this collaborative effort by uh, Paul Brindley and Alex Lucas who have been working on Opistorchus vivreni. Um, Opistorchus is another digenetic trematode that is considered a class three carcinogen. And it causes, uh, it infects the liver and it causes liver cancer um, and, and bile duct cancer. Um, and the, there's always been a question about how does it cause this cancer? Um, and it's actually granulin. So um, Opistorchus granulin causes the proliferation of human fibroblasts. Um, in a pair in a it, when the parasite is in the tissue and it's why it's a class three carcinogen and they've shown through a number of experiments that they can essentially eliminate the proliferative effect by by knocking out the granulin of opus dorcas um so and there's other examples like that where there's been there's this sort of like xeno effect um like a, an effect from one species granulin on another species um and it's always proliferation in um in the examples that i know so what the current thinking is, is that, that, is that it's this three-dimensional structure of granulin that's being recognized and conferring the effect. And that is further complicated by the fact that granulins from that propeptide can be cleaved into smaller fragments that often are immunostimulatory and anti-proliferative. So this gets to the autofeedback example where when we look at granulin, and we look at granulin expression after we inject granulin, we see an increase in granulin expression. 
So there has to be a way for an organism to turn that off. Otherwise, it would just proliferate forever, right? Like you would have, it would just be a blob of growing cells. Um, and so what it looks like is happening is that as granulin increases in expression, you have more and more circulating cells. We're starting to get some evidence that, that granulocytes at least produce an elastase that's cleaving the progranulin peptide. And that is critical because then the, the fragments of the granulin are immunostimulatory in the snail. We've, we've been able to show that they have some immunostimulatory um, properties. Um, and we're starting to to try to characterize whether or not they're anti-proliferative. But we, we think that because of the fact that they are in other systems, they, they probably are in bioinflaria too. And that's probably then why we see this decline in granulin expression after we see this big peak is that granulin is essentially turning itself off because it's creating all these cells that produce the enzyme, that cleave granulin, that then turn off granulin expression. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting auto sort of auto feedback system that um, is still very poorly characterized, I think, but um, but hopefully that answers both of your questions somehow. <laughs> okay, thanks. So we have time for a last quick question. Sure. If <laughs> that, that there is any <laughs> in the room. Anyone here with one more question? Oh, there might be one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I'll maybe answer that question first. Yeah. So the first question is, um, are, is there a similar effect observed in other species that are known to be hosts of S. mansonheim, other species of bimfilaria? So um, the, the short answer is yes. So we took that recombinant granulin and we injected it into a number of different other strains of bimfilaria, as well as Pfeifferi and Sudanica. And then we challenged them with two different strains of S. mansoni. And some of those, um, some of those challenge experiments are completely incompatible. So for example, Sudanica, with the two strains that we challenged with of S. mansoni, there was zero snails were infected. Um, same with the BS90s. But in the other examples where there is some compatibility between the parasite and the snail strains, in all examples, if we injected granulin ahead of time, we saw an increase in resistance in resistant snails. So we saw a lower number of susceptible snails in those experiments. So we think that we think that granulin is having the same effect. When we did those experiments, though, we actually didn't know that it that it was generating this particular pool of TLR positive cells. So we we do have to revisit that experiment to see if that's why those snails are still are becoming resistant or more resistant. Yeah. Yeah. And your so yeah, it's your second part. And the, the second <clears throat> question is, uh, you mentioned that there is a variety of 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 TLR in bioinflaria. Uh, there is a differentiation of the TLR that are expressed in the enzyme, and it is linked to to the to the switch to the strain of the parasite or the strain of the snail? Sure. Um, I would love to be able to answer that question, but I feel like that could be my entire career trying to figure out what the other <laughs> other TLRs do. Um, yeah, it's a it's it's very complicated. Um, uh, like the other TLR that's really exciting is is BGTLR4, which is in the PTC2 region of the genome that I, I think both you guys and and uh, Mike Bluen's group have shown are uh, the genomic region associated with the BS90 resistance phenotype. And that um, that's really interesting as well. So I think biomphylicin is also in that region as well as this BGTLR4. So there's certainly other TLRs that we think are probably important to the resistance phenotype. And, and then the rest of them are very likely playing a role in defense against other things, bacteria or whatever else. 
Um, and that, that could go, or, or other trematodes, um, because it, we also have to remember that mancini, just some mancini is not the only one there. So what one is recognizing on a schistosome, you know, maybe just as an example, maybe it's a, a polymorphic mucin. An another parasite may not have those, and then it needs another PAMP that is a TLR recognizing that to, to be able to deal with that parasite. So um, yeah, it's, it's really complicated. Um, and I doubt we'll, I'll ever know the answer to that question before I retire anyways. Unfortunately. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Patrick. That was really interesting. And I think we need to stop there. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, you guys can continue discussing in the room. Sure, yeah, and if anyone online has any questions, feel free to tell me. No, that was, um, that was uh, the only question online. Okay. Thanks Great. very much, and bye-bye. Uh, bye, thank you. Thank you.